Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be going through eight very short adventures. Most of them are free or pay what you want, uh, and they're for various OSR systems. These are great, really, really cool. I, I, I've been trying to gather a few over the last few weeks um, because I think, you know, nice to have a bunch of free adventures from time to time, things you can add into your world. And uh, yeah, I have a bunch that I think are pretty cool. The first is the Isle of the Sea King. It's really just two pages. It's a map and then a key to that map. But I love the style of it. I think the hexes are really, really well done. All hand drawn, it seems to me. I mean, if there's a program that can do this, it'd be really, really great. Maybe it's digital, but it looks hand drawn to me. Really, really beautiful. Um, and the uh, the legend out there on the right. Now there's a terrain generator down on the bottom right. I'm not sure exactly why you need that, given that the terrain looks like it's already written on the map. But maybe you have like, um, if you want to add in new islands or something like that, you could easily generate them here. Um, now there's one one problem with this map. It's great, or this one problem with this product. It's great, but there's this idea here: the Isle of the Isles of the Sea Kings. It has this weird mirrored flip thing going on, which means as a PDF, it's really hard to read because you have to flip the page every time you want to read one side or turn your head upside down. Now, I think it's meant to be printed out and then you could easily fold it or cut it. And then you'd have both pages and you'd have them right there. That's not too hard. And it wouldn't be the end of the world to just copy, paste, flip, and put it on third page. But I would have preferred that to be the case, just have it there. Um, it's a one page hex crawl zine. Uh, which is which is great, but it's also like um, it's kind of one page. <laughs> I'm not sure why it wasn't just you know folded up and put there. Because if you do, if you were to print out this as a two sided thing, um, and you were to fold it, say, then your map would be folded in half. So again, I just I, I don't exactly get the benefit of flipping that there. Maybe it's a matter of space. I don't see exactly why that would be the case. But anyway, it's a nitpick because the locations are great. If you go through them, they're very very simple. You have um, the name of the hex in red, and then you have a brief description of it, and you have some bullet pointing that's more important. Now, if you do turn your head, you said there's a list of encounters for the different terrain types. There's an introduction as well, um, and then you have your, yeah, your various locations. So, I think it's great. Really cool. I wish we had more products like this, where you just get a, a region, some locations, and some hints about what might be there without a, a lot of, you know, detail. A lot of stuff that you can fill in yourself, which is, you know, I often, as a DM, I often don't really need fully fleshed out dungeons. I mean, it's great to have them, but what I really like are having adventure seeds that I can then build into my own campaigns or my own adventures. I like that. So, Isles of the Sea Kings. Really, really cool little two-page adventure. Um, I can recommend you check it out. And again, I'll put links below where you can get all of these adventures. The second one is Downsized Dungeons, issue 6, which is called Hunting Gemini. This is my favorite of the Downsized Dungeons, uh, I think by far. It's really cool. It's got a couple things going for it. First of all, the story here is really cool. There's these two brothers who were evil. They weren't always evil, perhaps. Um, but they became pretty evil twins. Um, eh, maybe, maybe they're always evil. Anyway, uh, they, they grew worse. Maybe, maybe they grew worse, and they and they uh, were kind of undead, and they torture people, and then they eventually disappeared, or something like that. Um, uh, well, they were they were burned and killed, so I guess they disappeared is one way of putting it. But they're not really gone. They're not really gone. Anyway, you have this sort of magic shop and a tavern, so it's a, it's a sort of a town based adventure where you have these two locations, but then there are, um, like you know rooms below that lead to eventually the same room and so they're sort of connected in the surface and so you could have this be a, a really interesting sort of side quest going on in your town um you get a few descriptions one is a tavern and the place below it the other is a magic shop and the place below it and then you get area five which is the torture room where they used to be and they're basically just ghosts down there um, they're specters there's yellow mold and a shambling mound as well and then there's a couple puzzles and things that you need to deal with here's the map i like the map a lot these are the sorts of maps that I really, really enjoy. I like isometric maps. I like things that you can easily see what's going on in the rooms, which is which. So once you've read through the dungeon, you know where everything is. Um, and you have the map up, and you can basically run from the map if you want it. But I like it because what you could do is throw this into a campaign, say, and maybe maybe there's this, you know, murderer that's running loose, or maybe someone starts disappearing. 
people start disappearing right off the streets and there's sort of this background rumor going on and the players get hired to investigate it, or maybe someone they're trying to look for gets gets captured or taken or disappears or something like that and so they have to investigate this and then they slowly find out that they're the, the murders are done in the style of these old murderers from you know years ago maybe like the brothers or something like that and so then they follow up the rumors and they find out where their houses used to be uh, and instead you know they have these this tavern built on the location of them or the, the magic shop is built on the location of them and maybe those are the people who have been possessed by the brothers ghosts and they're the ones going and doing the murder and so they capture one of them but the other ones you know anyway you could do a whole thing and eventually it goes all the way down here to the uh to the torture room where the ghosts are the specters i think that'd be really cool now granted specters don't possess but still, you could you could do a little uh, you know, DM magic and make them ghosts in that regard. So Downsize Dungeons issue six is my favorite of all the Downsize Dungeons. I think it's it's really really excellent. The map is good, the story is good. It ties into the location really well. It's an interesting location. You have cool uh, enemy. Yeah, best one. Awesome. The next one is the Positronic Library. This one is a really interesting kind of uh, you might say. Um, yeah, here's the front page. Uh, it's a very short dungeon. It's four pages, but it is really, really interesting. It's science fiction, so it's not going to work with everybody's campaigns. Although you could easily make it a wizard's lab and change some of the tech into, you know, magic tech, basically. Um, but I like, I like, I just like the way that it's laid out, and I like what's going on here. It's kind of cool. You have a couple of very flavorful rooms. So once again, you get an isometric map, and I really like these. You can see what's in each room. So once you've read through the description, you know what's there. Uh, very straightforward in terms of all that. You have some robots. You have some experiments going on. You have some very dangerous death traps. There's one instant death trap. If you, It's not really a trap. It's just an instant death effect. And the players kind of have to be stupid to do it, but still, um, you could they could do it. The players are pretty stupid and sometimes, so there are you got to be careful about that sort of thing here. But there is a lot of tech. There's like, you know, ray guns and hut and pistols and things like that. So again, you could change that to wands if you wanted to keep this into like a, you know, a, a fantasy world. You can make these golems instead of robots. But it's as written, it's a pretty science fiction-y. And it'd be, it, there's a lot of, you know, tech and, and you know, panels and switches and, and, you know, digital things and control pads. So it would be harder to just easily switch, but you could. Um... But again, most of what you have in the dungeon is this page, with then a brief description of each room here. The Puzzle Trunk Library, Southern Courtyard, Lounge, Experiment Room A, B, C, Map Room, Hall of Music, Court, and Tunnel. And that's it. That's the whole thing. Now, on the third page, you have what this what, what is really this is designed for. It's for Into the Odd or any other rules light OSR game, and it's very rules light. Um, it's created by Yoka Gall and Francesco Zanieri. Zanieri, I think. And then it's, uh, you know, the, the text license. And that's it. That's the whole dungeon. It's a very short, but I think it's really cool. It's one of those things where you could pick it up again and put it into a sci-fi world or run it as a one-shot in a sort of a gonzo thing. Or maybe it's like a crashed spaceship, right? Maybe it's not a, it's a library. Maybe it's a crashed spaceship or something like that. And uh, the players can go and investigate it if you want a little bit of science fiction in your D&D. So anyway, the Positronic Library, I think it's really cool. Okay, the next one is the Knight's Plutonian Shore, which is designed for use uh, with Shadow Dark. Now, this one was, I think it was intentionally intended to be um, added into the Game Jam, the Shadow Dark Weird Tales Game Jam, but I don't know if it was actually an entry in it. I think there might have been a delay or something like that so that it wasn't able to be put in in time. Or I, I don't know exactly all the details, but it wasn't, at least I, I think that's the case. But it's a great adventure, and I think it, it would have done well in that Game Jam um, if it had been, in, been included. First of all, the idea here is that there are these three witches, as you might expect. But unlike a usual coven, these ones hate each other, and they want to kill each other. And so even though you, it's designed for it's a low-level adventure, for levels 1, 2, and 3, and you're dealing with hags, a wield hag, a sea hag, and a night hag, which are very dangerous, very dangerous creatures in Shadow Dark, um, you're not going at it alone because probably you're going to get one of them or two of them to work against the other and then maybe turn them on each other. So it's actually sort of a really high stakes, dangerous game because these witches are very powerful and they can deal with you quickly, but you're not there to necessarily kill them all and they don't like each other so you could use them against each other. And I think that's a really cool idea. So essentially you have a dungeon or a region with a, you know a lots of rooms and, and places where each of the sisters is staying, the hags is staying, and you have a, a captured 
guy there who's who came to get their help or get revenge on him or something like that. No, yeah, he went there for to get their help, even though they're the ones that caused his whole trouble. But um, each of them give a different thing, and so they might have a different reason for siding with one or the other. Um, it's quite interesting. Now, if you want to resurrect somebody, because the witches can do that, then you need all three alive, and that'll be much harder. But anyway, it's it, it's less of a dungeon, or even less of an adventure, and more of simply like a place, right? You you take these three witches, you put them in a swamp in their their their, their lair somewhere, and then they're just a force in the world, and they have these relationships with each other, and they have these things they can do, and that's it. So it is an adventure, and you could run it as a one shot. You could easily do that, or put it in and put it into your world as an adventure. The players are doing. Maybe they have to rescue the guy. Maybe they have to kill the witch. Maybe they need to raise somebody from the dead. Whatever. Or you could just put this into your hex crawl, your west marches, as a place. And the players can use it, or not use it, as they see fit. Deal with the hags or not. They make these clay bodies, which they can then uh, possess. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. So you have the map, you have to turn your head a little bit, but I really like it. It's very easy to read, it's easy to see what the uh, images are. It's kind of a swampy, you know, foresty lair here. Um, there's a giant tree. Um, you can you can go over to the uh, front of it and go inside. Uh, that's where Gromal lives. You can go over to uh, uh, the um, sort of an island, you might say, on the right side there, and that's where Yuba lives. Then you can go down into the pits below, and that's where uh, um, Dolag, which is the third hag, lives. And there's uh, Eloran, who's the guy down there. And then the last page. So it's very, very simple. <clears throat> One of the encounters is a murder of crows. Actually, it's not a murder of crows, it's a raven. He's asking a riddle, and the, the answer to the riddle seems pretty obvious. But you never know. PCs are, are sometimes slow on the draw there. And one of the funny things is, of course, if you do fail, then there's a murder of crows later. And uh, and uh, then that becomes pretty funny. There's a little joke. It seems obvious now, doesn't it? Because the answer to the riddle is murder. It's a great adventure. It's a great adventure. The Knights of Plutonian Shore, I think it's very simple. But again, you put it into your world. Yeah, you have some, some very interesting characters and NPCs. And you have a, a sort of interesting tension between these very powerful creatures, which are beyond the players, individually, but not if they are working with you. Certainly together they would wreck any party of... I mean, you couldn't fight all three at once. You maybe, could, maybe you could fight one of them. Um, maybe. As a level one party, I think you'd still be dead. But if you can get them to help you, right, by maybe giving you those golem bodies to fight, or by fighting directly, or by giving you some other magic or something like that, then maybe you could take on one of the other hags. And so it's an interesting adventure in that regard. But there's nothing laid out for you. It's not like, okay, first you do this, and then that works out, and then you they, they're all weekend or something like that. It's, it's up to the players to figure out how to you know maneuver them against one another and how to convince them. So I think that's cool. So Knights of Plutonian Shore, which obviously is a reference to the Raven. Voyage Aboard the Flying Leopard. This is one that was designed. Um, this and the next were both designed for the Shadow Dark Weird Tales game jam. I really like both of this one and the next one. Actually, well, all, all three of the game jam ones, <laughs> really, because the Knights of Plutonian Shore I'm counting. This is a first to third level adventure designed for use with Shadow Dark. It's the Voyage Aboard the Flying Leopard. The fly Flying Leopard is an airship. And essentially, this is just another one of those adventures where it's a sort of location-based adventure where you have a bunch of people and rooms and events and then the players are let loose in this place and they're traveling perhaps and there's a bunch of npcs and a bunch of things that are happening and it's up to them to deal with it essentially there's just a, a ship going through the air and a person is killed there's a murderer and the players can try to figure out who it is what's going on and there are a bunch of npcs the passengers. You have the fugitive, you have the leper, you have the circus people, you have the archaeologist, and you have the priest. And then, of course, you have the crew and the stowaway. The captain, the officers, the specialized crew, and the general crew with some random deckhands. You have nightly events, you have conditions that are happening, complications that are happening, crew gossip that's happening. And then you have a map of the ship, the key to the ship, and the stowaway with a magic item held by the stowaway. And that's it. I think this is really, really cool. Um, 
I don't know. I just think it, it's a, it's really, really cool. Now, I said it was an airship. It's not an airship. <laughs> I keep saying that because it's the flying leopard. It's just a clipper. It's just a ship. I think it would be cooler if it was an airship. I don't know. That's always, that's me. But, uh, but it's not. It's just a regular ship and a bunch of people traveling. So it has a certain, it has a certain, um, you know, high seas, uh, I wouldn't say high seas. It has like a sort of maybe Victorian era Britain overtone to the adventure and the setting. You could ignore that if you wanted, but it would make sense to play it in that sort of game. Anyway, I think it's really cool. You have the just a, kind of like a, a tinderbox, a bunch of people and their motivations and what they're like, and what their secrets might be, and why you know, and, and the players might suspect this one or that one, and trying to figure out who it is. It, again, nothing's laid out. There's a there's again nightly events, but they're just it's a d10 table, so it's not like this happens first and then that happens first and then this next thing happens first and you go through. And, and then it just it continues on. So it's, it's, the players might not ever find the murderer. They might get to their destination and then get off. And, you know, who knows? But anyway, I think it's a really cool adventure. It's just a thing you put into your game, run it as a one-shot. Again, you, the players happen to be taking a merchant ship from one place to another or a transport ship from one place to another. You consider running Voyage Aboard the Flying Leopard. Great adventure. Very well written. And the NPCs are, are really cool, too. Very engaging. All right, the next is the detour to the city of Torment, which is a sandbox adventure. This is really interesting. Once again, designed for the weird tales. This is a very odd one. It's another ship one, essentially. You have the Wraith Catcher, which is essentially this, um, like, intraplanar, interplanar travel, dimension traveling ship, essentially. Uh, hidden at the edge of Chronospace, between the realms of life and death, lies the cursed city of Torment. A labyrinthine web of interdimensional gateways that are home to the darkest gods and most warped entities of this cosmos, filled with ed eldritch marvels of sinister eras, ruled by deranged tyrants and fueled by the echoes of dread and artifacts of a thousand nightmarish subdimensions. It is a domain of shadows and despair only for the bravest or the craziest adventurers. Traveling aboard the Wraith Catcher, the PCs accidentally end up in the City of Torment after the Navigator makes a wrong angular travel calculus. Whatever causes this miscalculation is a mystery, and worse than that, they are now trapped. It all seems to point to these mishaps. There's some coincidence, but there's something eerie about it. Now the PCs must find a way out while trying to survive a detour to save Torment. Now, there are a couple misspellings, as, as we've already just read through there. But I would say those are detours compared to detours, <laughs> details compared to how excellent this is. So first of all, the art in the background is excellent. It's creepy. It's engaging, you'll see. But really what you're doing here is kind of wandering through this weird city, trying to find your ways through, out, Maybe you're trying to come here for some particular reason. There's items here that are really, really odd. They're really cool. Brain in a jar, alchemical lantern, the sarcophagus armor, uh, the Kabbalist tome, uh, the arc light rig. You need to attach this plasma contraption to the storm deck of a shade craft in order to use it. It functions similar to a ray gun crossbow, but attacked, attached to the floor. So again, attached. Should be attached, not attacked. And with a line to grapple and catch phantasmagorical creatures you can counter check. Uh, there are rumors you can run through the streets of weather hazards, because this is a weird nightmare city, and so there's weird weather, and mishaps of flight. Powers of torment. So see, these have this really cool, evocative background art that's sketchy, but it looks like something from... I know there's an artist who did uh, Sigil, the City of Doors, back at Planescape Art back in the day. Really, really good artist, and I can't think of who it was, the name, but it reminds me of that. And I think that's the idea. It's going for that, right? Planescape is the City of Torment. Uh, or the Plane of Torment, um, the City of Sigil, I should say, and this is Torment. Uh, you have the Undying Lady is the Lady of Torment. Um, yeah, isn't there something like that um, in in Sigil? I don't know. I think that's kind of the uh, you know the, the system neutral version of Sigil going on. You have the Necronauts, the Cabals, the Cults, and the Feathered One, the Powers of Torment. The torment itself is nested inside the Green Flame Nebula, a dormant and lobotomized elder evil of unknown origins. It is not a compact location nor an easy one to travel through. Its wards span over thousands of Umbra Aeons and across multiple realities. The wards of torment, the description of them. So it's a city, essentially, right? It's a, it's, a, it's, a it's a cursed city, and you don't exactly walk. You sort of, like, have to will your way through, and you can use these ships to power your way through. Um, there are certain places and people you can run into, great tables for that. Uh, the Dramatis Personae, different people that you can run into. The Bestiary with the Nebula of Scamp, the Necronaut, Arclight, Weapons, Nightmare, Ocular Infinite, Succubus, Incubus, and then the Wraith Catcher, or any similar Shadecraft. So there are these yeah, ships that move through. Kind of reminds me of the Dark Eldar. 
um, the Drakari from Warhammer 40,000. Um, like the whole city, the whole concept, this plane of torment and torture and stuff. Anyway, really, really evocative and cool, man. This would work so well if you're doing like a planar compass campaign or you're doing any kind of, you know, semi-plane hopping campaign, a spell jammer campaign. Uh, your players get warped to a weird city dimension, a hell dimension, whatever it is, this would be awesome. So, Detour to the City of Torment, one of the most, um, oh gosh, evocative, flavorful of all of the game jam entries. It, it, it just kind of stands head and shoulder in terms of its tone above all the rest. I really like it. So, highly recommend you guys check out Detour to the City of Torment. All right, the next one uh, is the Barrow of Balagrim. Uh, this is for Dream and Expert Master. Uh, it's an introductory adventures, adventure for game masters and for players. So it's like an, it's a starter set adventure, essentially. It's a Barrow of an ancient dwarf hero, a chaos cult summons a sorceress scion of the worm that walks. So it's fairly straightforward in terms of what we've seen, you know, before. Old Burrow, or Old Barrow, I should say not Burrow. Old Barrow, uh, a cult that's trying to raise somebody there, undead. You, know, you get the picture. But I really like the way it's laid out. It has this odd, bright blue, which is good for you know um, people with color blindness often. I think blue is often a color that, that doesn't tend to be a problem. But it is kind of harsh on my eyes. The white and the bright blue there isn't pleasant to look at so much. And the text is very small and not my favorite size, not my favorite font choice either. It's just not my favorite formatting for a book. But I would say the layout is excellent. You have very clear paragraphs, a lot of reading in times, but but just that's in the background and introduction and stuff. For most of it, you have simple uh, entries with bullet points and things like that. So that's helpful. The gossip table, it's different than a rumor table, but it does have you know, true and false rumors. And you guys have heard um, my thoughts on true and false rumors before, and so I won't go into it here. Um, not terribly a big fan of false rumors that don't have any game ability or that don't point you to something true. But because they're gossip tables, if you were to set this in a setting and have players role play out, you know, learning about it, then then you could use those as, as, as you know, random people talking about the dungeon. And then the players would have less reason to necessarily trust, right? If you give the false rumors to people who have less reason to be right, the players can say, yeah, should we trust that one or not? And that's an interesting choice. Whereas if you just say, hey, you start with this rumor, players are gonna assume it matters. So I would say if you're going to role play out that, then yeah, that would be fine to use false rumors like that. Otherwise, not so keen. A couple entrances, which is always good to the dungeon. And then there is the uh, standing stones up on top. Um, now, it's, it's, it's for a particular setting, and so the rules are, are built for that, but I think you could easily adjust them. The standing stones lets you uh, get a plus three to all prey tests made to the dwarf god. It'd be interesting to adapt that to other games. Maybe say cleric, you know, divine spellcasters who worship a particular god, or maybe just lawful casters or something like that can get plus three to their cast up here, which would be really powerful. And if the players learn that or, or realize that, then maybe they could try to lure the cult out to it so they could fight uh, at, a, at a last stand up by the stones and get a benefit um, for their caster spell casting. If you're doing Shadow Dark or something like that, a plus three to cast would be excellent. Uh, you get the Barrow Dungeon itself, and um, it's, again, very straightforward. You've got the Worm Cult. You have uh, Marig, or Mariag, the giant spider. Um, she has a brood here, so there's a bunch of giant spiders. Doesn't, they don't like the cultists. And then you've got Balagrim, Skullbreaker, who is the ghost of the dwarf hero. Uh, you've got some beasters. You've got Crawling Qual Claws, Dwarf Skeletons, Ghouls, Giant Spiders, and Worm Cultists. Pretty straightforward, but you do have a little bit of anti antipathy between the cult and the giant spiders, and that's cool. Here you have the... Um, the barrow itself with uh, pretty well laid out and it's looped nicely. I like that. You can go four or five back to the main um, hall, one, two, over to three, little side room if you have a secret door investigation there. Um, seven, eight, nine on their own thing, and then 10 and 11. So it's, it's looped at the beginning and then continues forward nicely. It's, as I said, it's very straightforward, but what I really like about this place is that you have this repetition of the map very frequently for each room and that's really cool so you so you know exactly which room you're talking about now it doesn't have the sort of surrounding rooms so easily and that might be nice you just have the room itself but still repeated every entry with the room that's awesome 
Some people might say it's overkill. I don't think so. The only thing I would change about it is I think it would be better to have the relation, the orientation of each room to the next rooms coming up so that we know what's what's next. Otherwise, this is so great. Really, really like this layout. Then you get bullet points, you get bolding, you have cre uh, creature stat blocks laid out there. You have some descriptions in italics, which probably means you're supposed to read those aloud. I'm not a big fan of read aloud text, but it often totally works. And, and here it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's not excessive by any means. Um, it's descriptions of what you're seeing, which is good, rather than descriptions of what it used to be or something like that, which is obviously a problem. Um, it's a sensory description, and that, that's totally fine for me. Now, there is a harpy here, which is quite interesting. Um, probably not going to uh, want to uh, communicate with the harpy. Maybe you could, though. Don't know. Uh, Mother Maurig's lair with Billip. Poor little Billip. A uh, worm cultist, the son of a nearby farmer. Uh, they have good... The, they're, yeah, he's... He, Billup is uh, a fool, and his nonsenses have entertained the spiders for the past few days. So they're not eating him, but uh, but uh, he's a he's a cultist. He's not actually that that good of a cultist because you know he's just a local farmer boy. Um, what's interesting there is it does say um, if released, he will become fiercely loyal to the party. That's cool. You can get a little a retainer henchman here, former cultist farmer who wants to help y'all out. The pillared crypt. Uh, Kisvin's Chambers, the Cauldron of Slithers, which is really, really cool. Summoning the Scion, so you have this horrible thing being summoned. This worm. Nasty. But I like it. Really cool looking. The Hall of Anvils. It's a Dwarven Tomb, after all. Of course, there are going to be anvils in here. And then you get the Dwarf, uh, the Sepulcher of the Dwarf Hero. Uh, that bright blue is not my favorite, but the art is good. Um... And, uh, and I think the maps are great and the, the dungeon is great. Really cool. If you're running a, a, region, a regional hex crawl or you're running something like that, you add in, add in the Barrow of Belagrim. Uh, very easy to do. Um, straightforward and a competent, well-designed, low-level tomb. There are so many tombs, so many cults that we've seen in adventures over the years um, that when, I was surprised when I read this one to be like, wow, that's, that's really good. And interested in running it because I think a lot of people are not. Um, a lot, you know, we've seen this so many times that it's easy to just do the same exact thing. Um, and I would say it's not going to, you know, blow anybody's minds. But it's a free adventure that you can put out there that is competent, well designed, easy to run, enjoyable, fun. Got some funny bits and has some faction play, or I'd rather maybe not faction play exactly, but you've got the cult and the spiders, and that's 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 good. So very very good. And I would say introductory adventure. Um, highly recommend you guys check this one out. And finally, we have the Cur Crypt of Kursaba, which is an Argosa adventure. This is the only one that isn't free or pay what you want. This one is, uh, you have to pay for it on drive through RPG, but it's really, really good. <laughs> it's a really good adventure. Um, the art is excellent. The maps are really good. If you've seen recently, I've done a couple of Tales of Argosa adventures that I've reviewed. This one's no different in terms of its layout, in terms of its quality. Um, very easy to parse, very easy to read, even though the pages are busy, they're not that plain white, they have sort of a texture to them, which makes it a little, a little bit more distracting, and there's a lot of information, a lot of artwork, um, a lot of interesting font choices, a lot of background, so it's a lot going on, and despite that, the layout, the choices that are made in terms of bolding and, and format make it easy to read. So again, this is like top of the line. Right now, I'm, I'm really, really looking, I'm really happy with the way that these um, Argosa adventures are being formatted, and I think it's a good model. I wish other people would start to do it. I think it'd be a good idea for other people to start to do this sort of thing. And I know people do sorts of these sorts of things in their own way. Different adventures do different you know, ways of making their own formatting easier, but this is one really good way of doing it. Monsters are all in red, right? Um, items and magic items and things like that are put in blue, and you have locations in green. A really cool way of, of, of keying everything here. So the Crypt of Kursaba is an adventure site, which is always really good. I like that. You just put these as sites into your world, and you have adventures that are going on there. So this is a sandbox in that sense. It, it, it is added into a sandbox is the way of putting it. You get some rumors, um, which are, again, mostly helpfully true. Um, or at least partially true. 
uh, rumors three and four are not fully true, but they have elements of them that are true, and that's cool. So useful in that regard. You're not going to throw not, players aren't going to feel cheated if they have them, uh, at least not entirely. What what do they learn if the party researches more? Essentially, again, you have this uh, um, tomb that has opened up <laughs> over time. A landslide opened up a new tomb, and there are some ghouls in there. Uh, and then there's a really powerful creature down below. Um, but there is also magic items. So it's really it really is a location-based adventure. There's not something happening here that the players need to go and disrupt or something like that. It's really just there's a place. Players can go in. There's some undead and creatures inside. And there are treasures in there to get. So very standard in that regard. But you want those sorts of adventures in a West Marches or in a, in a Hex Crawl. So the Crypt of Crusaba would be great for either of those sorts of campaigns. Or running as a one-shot. Great adventure. Encounters as you travel through the mountains to get there, and then you have the maps. Now the maps are Dice and Logos maps, um, and it's a really good Dice and Logos map. I really like this one. You got three levels, to the, three levels to the dungeon, multiple ways of getting down each floor, uh, with one big shaft that takes you from the top to the bottom. So lots of, I mean, really well designed dungeon, and <laughs> really good choice for a for an adventure because you have just again lots of interconnectivity. Players tend to really enjoy finding multiple ways down. I think whenever you add verticality, not just verticality in terms of levels of dungeons, but verticality within one level of a dungeon, um, you, know, you have steps leading down from one f one place to the next within one level. Players tend to really like that. I really like that. Verticality in rooms is also really good, where you have you know platforms and you have uh, scaffolding and you have balconies and overlooks. Um, all of that stuff is really really good, and this dungeon does a lot of that really well. So. You have your levels, Crypt of Cassava, and here you have a detailed breakdown of whatever each what's on each room, which is great. The monsters and where they are, right? Mummies, veil, uh, veil winds, uh, ghouls, cadavers, zombie hounds, severed hands, crows, saga, all written on the map, so you know exactly where things are to fight. Um, and to the right, you have the room format, which again, if you guys have seen my other reviews, you'll know the, the uh, really really good here: red, green, blue, um, different. So icons for different sorts of senses and all that. It's a really good adventure. It's straightforward again in the sense of you're dealing with um, undead, crypts going down, ghouls, uh, things like that. Um, but there's some cool magic items here. There's some cool treasure here. Um, good art <laughs> for horrible creatures. And, uh, and I think it would be a really fun adventure to run. And I think it'd be very easy to run. I think probably read through this once, and then you could sit down at the table and play it, just with how easy these things are. It's a little creepy, a little creepy, but you can get the Spear of Kursaba at the end, which is a very good magic item. It's also a little cursed, <laughs> which is, is, is good for every powerful magic item. Yeah, I have a little bit of a curse there, right? But you can transform into a murder of crows. Kind of crazy. There's an aftermath, and then you get the uh, pre-made characters, if you want to run this as a one-shot with a player cheat sheet at the back for the system of Argosa. Crypt of Kursaba, excellent, well done. Highly recommend you guys check that one out. So in this one, we went through the Crypt of Kursaba, the Barrow of Velagrim, Detour to the City of Torment, Voyage Aboard the Flying Leopard, Knight's Plutonian Shore, the Positronic Library, Downsized Dungeons Issue 6, the Hunting Gemini, and the Isles of the Sea Kings. I'll put links below to where you guys can get all of them. All right, well, I hope this has been interesting to everybody, and I'll see you all in another video.